So we've been going through the book of Acts together, and, uh, and it has been so rich as we've been going through it. It has not felt like we're like, okay, well, this is the next scripture. I feel like every single week, it's like it's predetermined what I'm going to be preaching about. And I'll be talking with people, praying with people in men's morning prayer, and God is just like speaking the same thing. I literally feel like every week I'm telling people, you're preaching my message. They don't even know what I'm preaching on. They, they, they haven't read ahead. They, they're not like, oh, I know this is what Pastor Justin's going to be talking about. So today we're going to be into Acts chapter 16. So if you've got your version Bible, maybe you've got an actual paper Bible. They're very rare these days. They might be collector's items. Um, and uh, you, you can join with me, and we're going to get into it. And, and as we get into it, I just want to hit on something that is going to be something that we're going to drill down on today, which is one of our core values here is that we make space for God to fill. We intentionally make space for God to fill. And one of the ways that we do that is through our, our Sunday morning gatherings here. Um, we have our praise and our worship time and we have prayer times and things like that that we're tr- intentionally creating space for, for God to fill. And what I, what I mean by that, and maybe you're kind of new around here at New Life, is that we intentionally and unashamedly have longer worship services, in case you haven't noticed, um, than like some other churches around here. Um, and that's intentional. Um, so if you're looking for like a 45-minute in-and-out service, New Life Church is probably not for you. And that's okay, but it's just, um, it's intentional because we aim to provide an atmosphere where people encounter the presence of God. And we believe that that happens great in a time where we create space for God to show up. We invite him in, into our worship, into our preaching and teaching and prayer times and all of those things, we want to see God show up because when the Holy Spirit shows up, he not only changes the atmosphere, but he changes our hearts, amen? Amen. And I was thinking about it like, the Lord actually brought me back to him during a worship service. I'd come to the Lord at an early age, it was like in some before my ninth grade year and love Jesus and kind of, you know, kind of started straying away from him. And you ever, anybody ever like just try to like run away from God for a little bit? How'd that go? Not great. But like, you know, you, you're like the Jonah, like, no, I'm going to go the other way. And, and a friend invited me to a church service and my goodness, it was like the first song we're in the worship service and, and he just rejoined my heart. <laughs> ha. I'd like to say that it was the preacher, right? <laughs> because that's what I do, right? Like, I can't sing. But I like to say it was like a compelling word. I don't even remember who preached or what he preached on. It really didn't matter. I literally encountered the presence of God, and he reunited my heart with his in a worship service, as just as we're singing together. And we believe that in our worship, our worship helps to align our hearts with God's heart. It's what we do that's why, we, that's why we have create space for that to happen. We believe that our worship is spiritual warfare and that our praise is a powerful weapon. We believe that our worship is a, a time of a reset for our soul back to factory standard settings. And many of us, you know, we come in and we gather together to worship that it's not just a song time. This isn't just a, um, a time of music. It's much more than that. It isn't just a pre-sermon warm-up. It isn't a style, it isn't a a genre of music, it isn't a concert, and it isn't a time to showcase your talents even. Although, you wouldn't want me to stand up here with a microphone and sing. You're welcome for that, right? There's, here's the thing. I, I may not be able to carry a tune in a bucket, but I am a worshiper. And for those of you, maybe you're sitting next to me or behind me around me and you hear my Joyful noise. The, the Lord calls it a joyful noise. To you, it may be like, ah, he should not sing so loud, right? I mean, because this is a reality that like we are called to sing a new song unto the Lord. We are called to, to sing a joyful noise, to be a joyful noise unto the Lord. That is worship. And so we're going to get into Acts chapter 16 today, and um, we're going to talk about the power of this thing that we call or that God calls worship. So why don't you stand with me? Acts chapter 16. I'm excited. I've got a weighty word for us today. Acts 16, we're going to start in verse 16, and it says this, once when we were going to the place of prayer, this is Paul and Silas, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. And she kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned 
and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to practice, to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. And they had been, after they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. And when he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell, the dungeon, and fastened their feet, their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymn to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a, such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And at once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw that the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We're all here. The jailer called for the lights, rushed in and fell, in trembling, fell trembling before Paul and Silas. And he then brought them out and asked them, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Lord, I thank you for your word. We believe that it mines the gold out of us. We believe that it changes us, that it has the power to, the very power to fulfill it. And it is the very word of God. And so Lord, as we get into your word, I pray that um, we wouldn't leave this place the same, that it would change us, mold us, make us, and break us to become more like you. And uh, we trust that you'll do it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. So this, they meet this, this slave girl, Paul and Silas. We see that in verse 16, right? That they, they meet this, this slave girl. They're on their way to the place of prayer. And um, this girl predicts the future. She earns a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. Um, so I want you to understand something. This girl is very spiritual, very spiritual, but how many of you know that you can be spiritual and that doesn't necessarily mean that you're being led by the Holy Spirit, right? That there, there are different types of spirits and um, she's very spiritual, but she's not necessarily being, being led by or filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and the Bible says that she makes a lot of money for her owners, for her slave owners. Um, so I want you to understand that she's not just going around opening up fortune cookies and reading them to people. Right? She's not going into the Portland Press Herald, finding the horoscopes and being like, what are you, a Capricorn? Okay, this is you. She's making a lot of money. So wh what that tells us is that this isn't just sort of a magic trick thing. Like the things that she is foretelling come true. So she isn't just kind of like, just kind of phoning things in and, and doing a facade thing. There's, there's a demonic influence, a demonic spirit that is behind the things that she's doing. And we also figure out and find that she's a bit much, like uh, she's a trip without the luggage, right? Like, I mean, she is, she's annoying, she's obnoxious, she's really loud, right? We, we kind of find that just from the way that it's, that it's posed in the scripture. Um, the, and let's just read it, verse 17, it says this, she followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. So the problem with this slave girl is that what she's saying is absolutely true. Isn't that weird? Essentially, the demonic spirit in her is agreeing with the truth. It's agreeing with Paul and Silas. I was, I was looking up in James, James chapter 2, verse 19. It says this, You believe that there is one God, good, even demons believe that and shudder. And what I was wrestling with is this, like, think about this. Um, could it be possible that demons have better theology than you do? That's scary, huh? Could it be that demons know the Bible better than you? I mean, probably true, right? That demons may have better theology than you do. They have better demonic faith. The difference is this. 
that they just hate what they know. That what is true life to you makes them shudder. So they may know and they may understand the intricacies of the Word of God, maybe better than you do, but they just hate that which they know to be true. And for you, as a follower of Christ, it is the very truth of the gospel that sets you free. And so, the, so there, there's, this, there's this reality that like um, this girl is being used as a puppet for the demonic. Essentially, she has the right words, but the wrong spirit. You ever, you ever been in a situation like that where like even, maybe you're even talking with somebody and you're like, they're saying the right things, but I just, this is off, right? Like you're saying the right words, but it's the wrong spirit. Like that, I can't necessarily like argue with you based upon this scriptural validity of all these things. I'm just telling you, you sound like the slave girl, right? Like, I mean, you're saying the right things, but it's the wrong, the wrong spirit that, that's kind of happening here. And this is what's, this is what's going on. And, and you may be thinking, well, that doesn't happen anymore, does it? I think you're misunderestimating the depth of evil because definitely it happens. It happens, it happens all the time. It happens to us where, where we're kind of struggling with like, well, this is true and I, and I agree with this, but I just feel like the spirit of it is, is off. It's wrong. And what we find out and what we know to be true in our own lives is that we are created to be worshipers by nature. God created us to worship. And if Jesus is not the center of who we worship, we will find something else to worship. We will find an idol. We will find a false god. We will find something else to worship. So if it's not Jesus, then most likely it is something else. And maybe for, maybe for some of us it's success or money um, or ourselves or other people or, or the love of control or possessions. Whatever those things are, if it's not Jesus, it will be something else. Why? Because we are created to be worshipers. And so this girl, she's shouting. Shouting for days. The word shout, and I looked it up in the Greek because that's what pastors do, um, is this word kradzo. Look to your neighbor and say, she was kradzo. She's kradzo. Now, you might be wondering, like, what does that mean? So it can actually maybe be better translated as shrieking or screaming. So it's not like she's just shouting, like talking really loudly, like she's shrieking or she's screaming. So essentially, this... Um, She's actually making a demonic distraction, like, uh, uh, which is essentially what the demonic does, always. It tries to draw attention to itself rather than to God. You ever been there where it's like, if you just pay attention to all this drama, if you just watch the news and just get enraged, if you're not mad about something, just watch the news for five minutes. If you could just pay attention to this or what this person's doing or not doing, if you could just pay attention to the, all of the, 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 the whirlwind of things that are swirling, then... I can distract you from what it is that God's doing. And that's what the demonic does. It draws attention to itself rather than God. Again, right words, wrong spirit. In verse 18, it continues. It says that she kept this up for many days. It says, finally, Paul became so annoyed. Let's pause right there for a second. I love this because um, there's times when you read the Bible and you're like, man, some of the ways that, 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 that they tell this story, you know that it's, that it's not made up. Because if somebody was going to make up this story, you wouldn't, you wouldn't make Paul look bad. You wouldn't make it look like Paul just, just got like fed up with this and he's so annoyed. You'd say things like, Paul moved with tender compassion, set this young sprite free right, from, from, from the, the, the bondage of the demon, you know, like, you'd be like, you put in a kind of a little term that, like, made Paul look like, man, he did such a good job, but no, we read it, and it's like, Paul got so annoyed, he turns to this, to this woman and speaks to the demon, and what does he say? He says, in the name of Buddha, in the name of me, in the name of Paul and Silas, in the name of all the disciples of Jerusalem. What does he say? You know, he says, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And the Bible says that it was at that moment that the Spirit left her. I just want to remind you, and we say this again, and we said this all throughout the book of Acts, is this, that the name of Jesus sets people free. Amen. There is something powerful about the name of Jesus. And you know this to be true. There's a reason why in your workplaces and around people that don't believe in Jesus, there's a reason why you feel this muzzle of not wanting to say the name of Jesus around people for fear of how it's going to go, how they'll respond. So 
So this girl gets free, and it's awesome, right? I mean, like, the demonic spirit leaves her. I'm, I'm guessing all of a sudden she was, uh, I don't know, kind of demonized, and all of a sudden she's got joy. All of a sudden she's free. She's got a smile on her face. She's got a pep in her step. She's got joy in her heart. I'm sure everybody's really excited for her, right? Well, not her pimps. Her pimps are not excited for her. In fact, they realize, oh, no. My bre- yeah, exactly. My bread and butter is gone. I'm not going to be able to make any money off this girl anymore. And so they freak out. They, they drag Paul and Silas in front of the magistrates. And this is what they say. Verse 20. They brought them before the magistrates. And, they, and catch these words. I want you to see these. He says, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar. Can I remind you, church, that Christianity should be disturbing the status quo. Should be. Christianity is never going to be the norm. And I mean this, I mean this in love, and I think, that, I think it needs to be spoken into our culture right now, is that the gospel will never neatly fit into the world's order. This is what Jesus says, not me. The gospel will never neatly fit into the world's order. And if it does, it's probably not the gospel. It's probably some form of godliness, but lacking the power therein. So it never, it's never going to be the norm. Because Jesus always comes in and takes an upside down world and turns it right side up. And when you do that, the people that think that upside down is normal and not dysfunctional, all of a sudden turn right side up and what? They're angry. You upturn the apple cart. You are, you're causing this city to be in uproar. The gospel will always upset the norms. And if it's not, it may not be the gospel. And so, so what I would say to you as a Christian, as a Christ follower, we can talk about the, the American church, but I'm just talking to you right, individually right now. Quit trying to fit in. You won't be able to. You're called to stand out. It doesn't mean that you're judgmental. It doesn't mean that you, you know, telling people, confronting them with their sin, all these things. It just means that, that you, you'll never fit squarely, neatly into the world's order if you're a Christ follower. You're, you're, you're called to be weird. You're called to stand out. And so we see Paul and Silas, and these guys stand out. I mean, and then their day... I like to say, like, and then everything was awesome, and they were blessed, and <laughs> built a church, and retired in Boca Raton, and all of these great things. And it actually says that there was a very unexpected twist that day. I'm just going to read it to you, and just take it in. I want you to just kind of put yourself in their shoes. Verse 22, the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell, the, the cell within the cell, the dungeon, the, the place with, with no airflow, the place with, with no windows. They were in the inner cell, and he fastened their feet in the stocks, which aren't just like nice little cuffs. Right? with chains, like many, of the, many times these things were actually used to, to maybe hold somebody upside down by their feet or to splay their legs out so far and their tendons and ligaments stretching so much that it would just cause constant pain and cramping. And so this, when it says, like, I put their feet in the stocks, it doesn't just mean like, oh, yeah, and then they also put like an ankle bracelet on them. Like it means that they were in pain in a dungeon. This is a bad day, right? I mean, so you had a bad day. And that, like, like, this is a bad day for any of us. They start the day freeing this slave girl from a demon, and it results in them being stripped naked, beaten with rods, feet in the stocks, and put into a dungeon with no hope or no understanding of necessarily why or what was going to happen to them. And, and I was wondering this as I was, like, studying this week. is like, what makes a crowd, think about this, what makes a crowd attack two men who set an abused girl free? How messed up is that? 
What makes a crowd treat two guys who set an abused girl free? And I think it has something to do with the fact that Paul and Silas were messing with what the crowd was worshiping. Whether that's comfort, status quo, money, things that we consider normal, turning things upside down or right side up that were upside down. What we know to be true is this, that we vehemently defend our idols. And many times when our response of something be removed or changed and it seems like out of the ordinary, almost inflamed to, to a degree that it, it doesn't seem normal, the reality is, is many times we're vehemently defending our idols, our false gods, the things that we've placed over God and we're willing to do whatever. Obviously, this, these people are willing to, to take out these two men who freed a slave girl. Why? Because you messed with what we're worshiping. Which is why, like in our day, in our day, it's okay to be spiritual, isn't it? I mean, spiritual. It's celebrated. We want you to be spiritual. The world wants you to be spiritual. And and it's completely fine for you to follow many, many different pathways to spirituality. It's good for you to be, uh, you know, to follow Hinduism. That's fine. Reiki, awesome. Tarot cards, cool. Crystals, awesome. Great, cool. Even Islam even in the face of how they treat women, it's still okay. Like, yeah, you do, you do, you. But the name of Jesus? Church, the name of Jesus divides a room. The name of Jesus divides a crowd. The name of Jesus divides a city. The name of Jesus divides a family, doesn't it? Like, the name of Jesus Christ will quickly divide what is of God and what is not. That, when we talk about the powerful name of Jesus, it has the power to to literally slice through what is of him and what is not of him. We see that even in our own world. We know that to be true. And so what we find in this crowd that should be supportive of the fact that this poor girl was demonized for so long and is now free. No, they're actually offended and view her freedom as an upheaval of what has been accepted as normal. How dare you? How dare you turn this thing around? This is, the, this is our norm. This is, this is what we do. This is how we make money. These are all the things. This is normal. How dare you upheave, upheave normal? Her freedom offends the crowd and the culture around her. And this is what I love, verse 25. These two guys are in the dungeon, and it says this. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. (laughs) I mean, think about this. It's the middle of the night. They're, 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 They're naked, beaten, bloody, hungry, feet in stocks, when everyone else is groaning, they're singing worship songs in a dungeon. This is, uh, this is so significant. I, I don't want us to miss this. I want us to understand this. I've been wrestling with this all week personally, not just as a pastor and what I'm going to preach. I'm talking about personally. Like, I mean this in love, but did you know that you do not have to have a worship team or a Spotify playlist to worship? As I was reading this account, I was confronted with this question. And I'll just ask it to myself. And it was this, am I depending on the holy karaoke of a Sunday morning as my worship. And I mean it in that way. Because church, as we, as we look at this story and you look at Paul and Silas, like, you can't help but say, like, am I missing something here? They got something that I just, I very rarely see. And I very rarely see it myself. These guys are just 
They, they understood that their worship may have sounded like a song, but they made no mistake that their praise was a powerful weapon. These guys, I mean, they, they weren't just singing because they were bored, right? It's like, hey, you know what? You know, why don't you just sing some songs here? I don't know. What do you know? I just know Christian songs. We should sing some of those, right? They weren't just singing because, well, it's Sunday, and we should probably do that because this is kind of what we do. Like Jesus Christ was their lifeline in good times and in bad times. And so you have these guys in the midst of just horrible conditions, in the midst of unjust treatment, in the midst of abuse, in the midst of uh, literally in pain, physical pain, they start singing songs in, in, in a dungeon. The Bible talks about bringing a sacrifice of praise, Right? And, and I, even, even as I go through, like, the Old Testament, sometimes, you, you know, you look back at, like, when they would go and, and bring, bring worship, right? They, it was a sacrifice. They would literally bring an animal, a live animal, whether it was a, a lamb or a bird or whatever that was, and they would put that on the altar, and it cost them something to bring. And I just wonder, this is the thing that I'm wrestling with on the inside of me. Like, when was the last time my worship cost me anything? And I hope they sing my favorite song. Like, I hope, I hope that when was the last time I viewed my praise as a powerful weapon of my warfare? These guys got it. They got it. And as we read this account, I mean, like, we're reminded that, like, we always have a reason to worship. If you're kind of like, well, I just don't even know. I'm kind of struggling right now. I just want you to take a look at Paul and Silas. Take a look at the unjust treatment that they're currently in, the pain that they're in, and they have a reason to worship. We always have a reason to worship, which means, church, that no matter what dungeon you may find yourself in, no matter what hopeless situation you may find yourself in, no matter how spiritually dry you may feel, how unsure you are about what is going to happen next, I encourage you to sing in the darkness. The Bible talks about sing a new song unto the Lord. And they weren't waiting for the team to start playing the, 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 the song or for the drummer to start kicking it off. They literally were just singing praises to their king in the darkness of the uncertainty all around them. I mean, these guys were, were not shaken by their circumstances because they were anchored in God. So, so because they had this unshakable faith in good times and bad, they saw this shaking power of God show up. The Bible says that, that God will shake that which can be shaken so that that which cannot be shaken will remain. And for maybe for some of you, even today, even this week, even right now, you're in a place where you just feel like you are just being shaken right? You've got, you got a diagnosis or this is going on in your family or things like that, and you feel untethered. You feel completely shaken. Sing in the darkness. We say this thing like, um, I was thinking about this week, when people ask us, we're going through a rough time, we'll be like, they'll be like, how you doing? And we'll say, well, I'm, I'm doing pretty good under the circumstances. You know, we'll say that. I'm doing pretty good, you know, under the circumstances. And I want you to see this. When we talk about Paul and Silas, um, they were not under their circumstances. They were above their circumstances. And I mean this as a prophetic word over you today, that circumstances happen, but you do not have to be under your circumstances. I mean this prophetically over you today. And I know I, 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 as, as, a, as a word over you, Circumstances happen, but that does not mean that you have to be under your circumstances. I think sometimes we read stories like this with hindsight being 2020, and we're like, oh, it must have been easy for them to start singing in a dungeon because they knew God was going to show up. They knew that this, the earthquake was going to happen. No, they didn't. They had no idea. We have the opportunity to see it from hindsight. Like, man, that must have been easy to see that. Their story had yet to be written. They had no idea what tomorrow held. They were literally singing in the darkness, having no idea what, what, what was going to happen to them that night or the night after or forever if they would not even live through the night. They had no, I, they had no idea. There's a scripture in Psalm 112, and I think that they got it. I hope that I get it. And it says this. Verse 6, 
Surely the the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. Verse 7. Catch this. Maybe you write this down. They will have no fear of bad news. Why? Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Can you catch that? Like, how do you walk through a horrible day, get horrible news, go through a beating, and literally be hung, stretched, whatever, in pain, having no idea what tomorrow holds, and still worship God in the midst of it? Why? Because they knew what the last word was. They knew the good news of Jesus Christ, which means that they had no fear of bad news. So they could walk through bad news, good news, any news, really didn't matter. Why? Because bad news had no hold on them. The only person that had a hold on them was Jesus Christ, which means that they could walk through good times and worship Jesus, and they could walk through bad times and worship Jesus. Why? Because all that other stuff really had no hold on, which is why Peter or Paul could write later on to live as Christ and to die as gain. Like, in other words, if, if I live, awesome, I get to praise Jesus. And if I die, awesome, I get to be with Jesus. This, this it was settled spirit that Paul and Silas obviously had and that they they were trusting and reminding themselves of who was in control. Because what we find out is that we truly discover our theology at midnight. (laughs) Don't we? Because before then, it's all theoretical. We we can say all day long, like, ah, I put my trust in the Lord. And as long as you don't have to put your trust in the Lord, you can say all day long, I put my trust in the Lord, until you have to put your trust in the Lord, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, I don't don't know if I can trust him at this moment. And, And very quickly, we find out our true theology at midnight. We find out what really, um, where our faith is during times of testing at midnight. George Mueller, um, you may have heard of him before. He, he, he wrote this, trials are food for faith to feed on, which is awesome and completely not awesome, right? Trials are food for faith to feed on, which means that when we go through times of testing, when we go through those midnight moments, when we go through those times where, where we've been unjustly accused or treated and we're praising Jesus in the midst of it, that those trials are food for faith to feed on. In other words, you don't get to grow until you have to flex your muscles to grow. And usually those trials give us the resistance to figure out what, our, what is our theology, and we usually don't find it out until midnight comes. Because you never know that God is all you need until God is all that you have. And if you've ever traveled, how many of you gone on like uh, short-term missions trips to like third world countries? Anybody? Anybody? All right. One thing you learn very quickly when you go outside of this kind of like American world that we live in is that you find that the people that are in the worst circumstances usually have the most passionate worship. Have you ever noticed that? You go and you're like, these people have nothing. They got a big smile on their face, and they're, they're worshiping harder than anybody in here. I mean, they're just going after God, and you're like, what in the world? Why? Because they are oh so aware of who is in control. Many times we don't realize who's in control until we release control or until it's taken from us, and then all of a sudden we realize God is in control, and I actually thought I was, but I, have, I got nothing. I thought I was in control of the good times and the bad times come and I realized, oh, he's been in control of the good times and he's still in control even during bad news. That's the power of God. And, when, and that worship is, is just a powerful uh, weapon in our, of our warfare. Verse 26, this is where it gets good. It says this, suddenly. I love how it starts. Suddenly. There was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And at once, the prison doors, catch this, the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. Can I just remind you that our God is a God of suddenlies? Isn't he? And so many times, I just... I, We go through life, and maybe you're in this place right now. You've been hoping for God. You've been believing for God. You've been praying. You've been hoping. You've been believing, and nothing happens. And you're praying, and you're hoping, and you're believing, and nothing happens. It's 11 11 p.m., and you're praying, and you're hoping, and believing. Nothing happens. 11.30, you're praying, hoping, and believing. Midnight, suddenly. Suddenly. 
And this is the thing that I want you to understand is this, that suddenlies may happen instantly, but they don't happen without a, a process. They may happen instantly, but they don't happen without a process. So as, they, as he's praying and it's, it's 10, 10 o'clock and, and, it's, and it's 1130 and they're praying and they're worshiping in the midst of it and nothing is changing. They're still in pain and they're still in the midst of this uncertain place and they have no idea how this is going to, to end. God all of a sudden uses this as they commit to do what only they can do. God uses it to do what only he can do. But I, I need you to understand, they weren't worshiping so that the miraculous would happen. I, you got to get this out of your mind, right? So many times we, we treat God like he's a vending machine. All right, I'm going to sing Amazing Grace, and then you're going to give me this, right? I'm going to sing Amazing Grace twice. I'm going to get double blessing, right? They're not sitting there, and Paul and Silas, like, Silas, you're so good. you got a great voice. Could you sing Amazing God one more time? Sounds awesome. I think if we do one more time. Did you feel that? Did you feel it? I think that was all. You sing that one more time, the earthquake's coming, baby. They're not doing it to get God to do something. They're doing it because God's worthy no matter what. They're doing it because in some crazy, mind-melding way, they believe that God's in control and that he's still good in good times and even in bad news. That like to live is Christ and to die is gain and God's still on the throne even when I don't necessarily like what's going on currently. um, He's still in control. This absolutely blows our mind, and I, I, I often wonder, do I get that? Do I understand that? Do I try to treat him like a vending machine? God uses their worship to work through them, and not just for an earthquake, but to bring other people freedom, because our worship brings freedom out of hopeless situations. So the way out of your hopeless situation is through worship. Whether the earthquake happens or not, do you realize that? I want you to see this. As these two men are sitting bound, physically imprisoned in a dungeon, it was an unchained melody. Why? Because they were free men. They were free. It had no hold on them. Literally, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If the earthquake happens and we get freed, hallelujah. I can't wait to see how God does this. And if he doesn't, and whatever happens, hallelujah, God's in control and I'm trusting in him and I'm putting my whole faith in him. I'm worshiping him no matter what. Uh, That is something, as you read through this, like, God, I pray that you'd help me see in my own life that I'd worship you no matter what. And, and you may be like, well, I think this was maybe the earthquake is maybe just a coincidence, right? Like, the earthquakes happen, they're seismic, you know, fault lines. You could teach me all about it, I'm sure. But here's the thing. This earthquake was unlike any other earthquake. Right? Most earthquakes go like this, everybody dies. Right? Everybody dies. This earthquake, uh-uh. This earthquake, and then what happens? It says that the prison doors, every single one of them flew open, which would be cool, right, in and of itself. But, but they also have, 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 like, stocks on their feet, so that would be awesome. They'd be like, the prison doors are open. Oh, come on, right? So literally, not only are the prison doors open, it says that all the chains of every prisoner fell off. That's quite an earthquake. Usually, everybody dies. This one, This is a God-ordained movement where he shows up and does things that, that honestly they never could have even dreamed of. And the beauty of it is this. Did you know that your freedom isn't just for you? Did you know that that God setting you free, that your worship is not just for your freedom, that your praise is not just for you? That when God frees you, that when he sets you free, when God has taken you, plucked you up out of the miry pit that he found you in and set you on solid ground and freed you from addiction and brought you and brought healing to your marriage and restored things in your life, do you realize that it wasn't just for you to be like, isn't that awesome? God's so amazing. He actually does it for those around you too. That's what happens here. He does it. It's, It's for the person next to you. It's for the guy in the cell right behind you. 
God brings freedom not just for you, but for those around you. Because why? Because the Bible says, there's a little thing that we missed even in the, in the beginning. It says, while they were singing, it says that the other prisoners were listening as they're singing. Do you realize that people are watching your life? Even right now, you're like, they're watching me? I know the government's watching, but no, people, just normal people, your coworkers are watching you. Your kids are watching you. They see how you act, how you behave, and they want to know, like, are you still going to be worshiping Jesus even when life gets difficult? I, is this real, does this, does this thing really work, or does it only work when you're walking in blessing? Or is Jesus really, truly your lifeline? Is that who he is? See, when you choose to worship God, even when you don't feel great, you inspire hope in other people to worship God in their midnight moment as well. And you not only set yourself free, it sets others free as well. Amen? Why don't you stand with me? <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, gonna to poke, poke at you a little bit here. Um, I think that, that many times we get, we, get some, we get this idea that we, our role to set other people free comes through um, us confronting them about their sin. Now, I, I need to tell them what they're doing is wrong, this lifestyle's wrong, this is going to send them to hell. They, you know, I, I, I need to let them know and this is, this is my role of how I set other people free. And so we get weird, right? I'm just, let's talk about Christian weirdness right here for a second. Like, um, we, we do things like, um, you know, you're drinking coffee with someone. They're like, oh, the coffee, this, this coffee's hot. Not as hot as hell if you don't repent today. <laughs> Not as hot as hell, I'll tell you that. The demons would disagree with you. Okay. Or we try to add Jesus into every conversation, which is also weird. They're like, oh, hi. And you're like, there's no high like the most high. <laughs> right? And we get to this place where we start, like, people, we get to weird stuff. Like, well, should I choose the, the, the steak or the, or the fish? I don't know. What is Jesus asking you to choose? Maybe you should choose the fish. He is the fisher of men, is he not? Right? We get to this weird stuff where we think that like our role is to confront other people of their sin. Here's the reality. Whether we want to admit that, yeah, this is a sin, and, 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 and whether, I, whether I want to say, no, it's not, yes, it is, no, it's not, yes, it is, when we're confronted with freedom. Look at this slave girl, even in the midst of <laughs> what she thought was her job and her life, all of a sudden when, she, when freedom came to her, there was no discussion she realized where she was at. And many times when we try to act that way of like, no, I like the most high, we sound a lot like the slave girl did. Right words, wrong spirit. Do you want to know what changed <laughs> the whole prison? Do you want to change a jailer? who had just recently probably gave a few extra beatings to Paul and Silas and put them in, in a splayed position all night long. Do you know what changed his heart? These two crazy guys worshiping Jesus in a rat-infested dungeon. Who does that? I mean, who in the world? Let me tell you what. If you want to get the attention of some hardened criminals, do that. That's just weird. There is something different about you. When we live a life after God that stands out, that is a life that is so hope-filled, so humble, so full of life, that, that, that people can't help but ask us for the reason, for the hope that we have in Christ. Or people say, man, I, I, you're, you're different. I, I, you're kind of freaking me out, but man, I, I want that joy. I don't know where you're getting that from. But like, do you realize the bad news you just got? you realize the situation you're in? How in the world are you praising Jesus? Like, obviously it's not working, right? Like, you should be praising. How? How do you do that? 
Listen, your worship is personal, but it was never meant to be private. You realize that? I grew up in a, in a church, maybe you did too, where your, 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 your worship, your relationship with God, your religion wasn't talked about. In fact, going to, going to church as a kid, if I just sat there, shut up, and didn't pinch my sister, I maybe would get a donut after church, and that was the end goal. Like, you're like, I, if, I, if I could just, just keep that to myself, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't want to talk about that. Was, this is a private thing, and, and your role is to just sit there, be honoring, and, and shut up about it. And, 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 but your, your relationship with God, your worship is personal. It is but it was never meant to be private. So what is the Holy Spirit saying to you? What is it that God, like what what dungeon do you find yourself in or what area of life do you just find like as a hopeless situation that you've just kind of given up hope on and you're not praising him in the middle of it. You're just kind of like, you know, you got this thing off to the side or maybe you're in a place where, where you just got some news this week and you're like, man, I just, I just don't have any hope in this situation. There's no hope. Let me just remind you, there is hope in your situation. Why? Because as followers of Jesus Christ, you are not under your circumstances. Your circumstances are under you. which means that God's in control in the midst of bad news. So what is it that, that you're struggling? Maybe for you, it's like, I, I, I know I need physical healing in this area of my life. I don't, I, whatever that is. It's very easy to let anxiety take control or to fear to take over, but don't let anxiety of the future steal your praise for today. So what I want to do is I want to, I want to give you a, I want to give you an opportunity. We always end with with worship in here, and I'm going to encourage you right now as a step of faith to say, I'm going to choose to get out of my seat, to walk forward, and to praise Jesus in the midst of my circumstance right now. And maybe you're in a place, you, you, know what, you know what God's been bringing up. You know that thing that you're just been like, yeah, I know that dungeon. I know that place. I know that, that area of my life where I've just, I'm not walking in hope. I'm not walking in praise or in worship. And I'm just kind of given up. And, I, and I'm actually not trusting that God is in control of this. And I'm actually not trusting that he's in the midst of it. But I'm choosing, I'm going to choose today to walk in it. So I'm going to ask you right now, Ed, you can just start making your way up here, come out of your seats right up here, and this is just between you and the Lord. You're just going to say, you know what, I, God, I, I'm going to choose you to, to praise you in the midst of it. I don't know how it's going to work out. I don't know how the earthquake's going to happen. I don't know if the earthquake's going to happen. I'm just choosing to praise you because you're worth it. Amen? I want to read this as you're coming up here. There's this, uh, there's this quote. Keep coming, keep coming. There's this quote. I want to read it to you. It's from a friend of mine. He has it on his email. And it says, it's by a guy named Ferdinand Falk, who was a French general in World War I at the Battle of the Marne. Doesn't mean much to you, but I figure give you a little information. This was a telegram that he sent right before he attacked. He said, hard pressed on my right, my center is yielding, impossible to maneuver, situation excellent, I'm attacking. <laughs> so you're like, well, I, you, you just don't understand. Like, yeah, this is going wrong, and this is this is this is not going right, and it just seems impossible to maneuver. I, I don't see a way out of this situation. Excellent for God to move. I'm attacking. I just want to encourage you today, as we as we enter into some worship. And I know there's a few of you right now that you, you're just kind of stuck. And you're like, you know what? I don't, I don't know if I can trust him right now. I just want to encourage you. Maybe you just take a step of faith today. What do you have to lose, really, to come to the place of I'm going to choose to trust him. I'm going to choose to praise him even in the midst of the storm. And so, Lord, I lift up. I pray that you would um, take off the heavy weights of our feet even today, right now. Cause us to just say, God, I'm going to trust you right now. I don't even know what that looks like. I'm going to praise you in the midst of the storm. I'm going to praise you in the midst of the darkness. I'm going to sing. I'm going to sing right now, even though I don't feel like it. And so, Lord, I just, maybe right now, I want to encourage you. Those of you guys who are up here, those of you who are in that place right now, uh, don't wait. I know what you're doing. You're waiting for the, waiting for the band to start playing. You, you, you not, won't wait. Stop waiting for the band to start. I want you to start, just start singing. Just start. You're like, but I don't know what to sing. Okay, just sing. 
Just sing your heart to God, whatever it is. God, maybe it's like, I don't understand what this, what's going on here. I don't understand how, a way out of this, but I'm trusting you. And I'm lifting you up in the midst of it. And so, Jesus, I pray that you would make way where there seems to be no way, that even as we, uh, we walk in the middle of trouble, that we have no fear of bad news. Why? Because our heart is steadfast and our trust is in you. And so, God, we don't know how that's all going to work out, but we choose to trust you, to worship you in the midst of the dungeon, and we, because we, you're worth it. You're worth it no matter what. So we lift you up high right now. So, church, we got this song, and I, and I, I don't worry about the, the music and all of that, that the words to it are all about singing God and singing to God and worshiping him in the midst of darkness. So why don't you join me in singing together? Let's go.